Welcome to our Compose Cast, where we discuss productivity, self-hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co-host, Jack Moore. How are you doing today, Jack? I'm doing well. I'm doing very well this uh, evening, I'll say. Um, I have a quick question for you. So I see you look up. Do you have a, like a cue card right there that you look at? Is that is there something right above the camera, right near the camera that you end up looking at? Oh, I don't. And that's a really good question, too. So I see you look up and I didn't know if it was off of memory or what it was most of that is off of memory so what i got going on right now is i've got you in a couple different locations and i got me in a couple different locations so i am i am in obs with you i am in jitsi with you and then i also have right next to the camera it it pops out and turns to face me the uh the the camera display now this is a camera that i'm borrowing right now uh and and just kind of trying out it's a it's a lumix g7 um, and it, it's, it's probably the one I would get if I were to get a DSLR. Um, so I'm looking at eBay. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be really cheap about it and get something that's, totally. that's, you know, re- really cheap. Uh, cause I have almost all of the accessories. So I just need the camera and the, the lens itself. Uh, but, but having it would be, would be great as, you know, as you can see here, it, it, it it's, yeah, you're it's, coming in crystal clear t- today. It's, yeah. It's really fun. But the, the, camera itself actually has its display able to swivel out and 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 flip around so i can i can watch myself and has a couple interesting cues like for instance uh, my buddy john who is who is uh helping me set this up was showing me it will actually highlight uh in in green where the focus is so right now it's highlighting like my my eyes Right, uh, a little bit of my hair, my my headphones, uh, some some of my neck stuff over over here, like the the top of my shirt. So so yeah. I can I can see that that stuff is indeed in focus, and, and and that's especially nice because it is such a you know small little screen, um, I, and I'm an arm's length away from it, three Eastern, feet or yeah. whatever. Yeah, so yeah. it's 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 good to good to be able to see that. That's awesome. Yeah, I knew you had the new camera. You look great over there. Thank you. <laughs> From this side. Thank you. <laughs> uh, do we want to jump into it? I know you, I saw you had a few uh, intro items there. Yeah, I'm coming back to the Python stuff. Uh, there's okay. there's some interesting developments going on. Uh, so recently we had just gotten the, the Walrus operator, which was the way to do uh, assignments uh, as you're doing conditional statements, which is awesome. Uh, you know, that's that's been in other programming languages for a while now and something that's even more fundamental that hasn't been around is the match case statement so anyone who's ever programmed bash will be familiar with the the match case and it's you know case i in your variable and then you you list out the different cases it's known as a switch case or pattern matching whatever you want to call it it has not actually been in Python up till now. But the history, if I recall correctly, is that it was actually fundamentally proposed in the 2000s sometime. There was a a PEP Python enhancement proposal uh, to yeah. add it, and it just got zero backing whatsoever. Like, no one was was interested in, in working on it. So they just said, all right, well, we're, you know, if, if no one wants it, we're obviously not going to work on it. And I believe it was actually Guido himself who submitted the, the pull request to actually implement this, this pep and said, Hey, you know what? Now that he's been able to, to get some time to, to step back and he's like, I, let me, let me put this in. I think I, I chose this because it goes through and has the best use cases for something like this. Now, switch case statements or, or match case statements have been around for a while. But implementing it in something Pythonic has uh, certain advantages that we're going to want to be aware of. Uh, the first one is going to be whenever you have uh, an, an error come back, usually that's going to be a, a type of error, right? And instead of having to catch them, um, or, or, you know, if, if you're going to catch them, right, you could, you could, uh, do like graceful closes or graceful resets or whatever, uh, depending on what you want to pass to it. It was, I think we were looking at best practices and it was, um, 
so what is it in i guess non-statically typed languages you don't have to specify what you're returning so you can return kind of you know you can return a string you can return nil you can return an integer and one of the best practices was make sure you return like one type per method don't you know you can't make it scattered all over the place now this would be a way to kind of give you a crutch in the sense of if i return none versus if i return an integer or if i return a string Uh, so you could you could do that but it's it's obviously going to be a lot more beneficial for you to to keep to that best practice which would allow even more stuff to be done with this uh so i i I would recommend reviewing the article there's there's a lot of cool ways to use this and 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 just a lot of ways to use case you can use it uh with with or operators you can use it with lists with tuples objects i think you said yeah i'm looking at it right now match media object case you know image you can check the type yeah, Python's always been super flexible, and they they bring that exact same flexibility to this. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so there, it's not like this is the brand new. This is they've had. What is it? Is it switch case before? No, they haven't had. They they've had if else. Been, wow. Okay. I mean, you could just write a really long if else. Oh man. Yeah. Oh, why? <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. It's like I don't know why I was thinking there were cases. It was switch cases in Python, huh? How about that? All right. Yeah. Learn something new every day right there. And, and honestly, I was kind of the same. I was like, before this was brought to my attention, I was like, well, I I, I guess I've never used one. Yeah. <laughs> I have more often, though, ran into instances where I'm like, having a walrus operator would be nice. Have, having that would yeah. be would be good. And then I could just assign this if it's there and, and move on with it and haven't been able to to do that up till now. So that's that's right versus- definitely something I could see um, being a lot more prevalent. This is going to be just a quality of life improvement to especially just to know that that's available to me. Now, the next article that I wanted to bring up is is just a just a good productivity piece Uh, i was just really interested to to go through this and and i kind of wanted to get your take on the article here on the uh oh okay so you moved them around here it's being the hbr the harvard business business review being more realistic about the time you have it was prescriptive i kind of liked it it Mm -hmm. was uh i think she she here i forget who wrote it um sabina nawaz had about four or five things basically prescribing hey you know watch out for kind of what i took away from it was you can't you can't do everything all the time you can't be i guess the rock star the superhero all the time right the one thing that stuck out was documentation documenting it and she said um, writing extensive documentation and then instead of spending hours revisiting a document she would simply return it and request that they follow guidelines five and seven for example before coming back to her so it's basically saying hey you know what go to the documentation review these two locations and then come back to me if you're still running into issues and i think you would even mention this about at work you were running into you know hey people reaching out saying hey you know I don't know how to do this. Like, well, did you read the documentation? You know, people might come back and say, oh, no, I, I didn't even know it existed. And they're like, okay, well, why don't you read the, through this, walk through it, and then come back to me. And they're like, you know, they might come back and say, hey, I have problem one here. And it's like, okay, did you read all the documentation? Because it's actually covered in there, right? I'm not even kidding so, you. I ran in, I have run into that three times so far this week, and it is Wednesday. Yeah. What, what, what I found, <laughs> and, and, and what I've actually found is helpful. So, So what she says here is that instead of of spending hours revising a document, she would return it and request that they follow the guidelines, right? So the the first request actually still came to her, and she actually still handled the request. She actually said, hey, um, yeah, I'll I'll take a look at it. And she took a look at it, and she said, it's not meeting our guidelines, right? And, And this could be the same in tech, right? Um, I don't know how to do this. Um, can you help me out? Uh, or, or I think I have this completed. I think I ran, I completed this, uh, yeah. this change request. Um, and then I see that there's like a whole bunch of fields that haven't been filled out. 
right? What I want to do is point them to the exact same documentation that I wrote and that I uh, continue to refer them to and that I presented to them, right? So, so I want all of my, my, my notes and my documentation and my presentations to be the, the, the same document because if it's three different documents where are you going to go to look when you have a problem right right you want to know if i have this problem i go to this document so that's that's very interesting so she she does uh say a lot of that is documented and actually so so two of the times this week i didn't have documentation for what it was but it was something that i've done i've just kind of handled so i said you know what i'm going to take 10 minutes Um, document this and get back to you i got met with like the deer in the headlights look it's like oh i but but this is this is today we're doing this today and i'm like well we're doing it at two and this is 10 30 so i'm gonna take 20 minutes to write up documentation we're gonna fix the problem the correct way and we're not gonna have the problem again right and the result of that was the documentation was followed. I, I, I actually, I, after I wrote the documentation, I, I hopped on a call and we walked through it. Uh, there was like one step I was missing. So I went ahead and, and put that in the documentation. And at that point, independent of any prompting of my own, uh, my colleague said, great, thank you. I'll take it from here. And I'm like, uh, okay. And, and and she's like, yeah, I Obviously, it's it's right here. We just walk through it together. It's easy enough. Yeah. So I've got the second half that I have to do. I'm just going to do that right now um, and then get back to you if I have any questions. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> that's fine with me. How about that? So it, it works. It really, really, really does work. And people want to be, uh, we're, we're talking about, you know, what's, what's, uh, what's autonomy mean, right? People want to be able to do things independently. They want to feel empowered, right? Having that documentation for them to reference is a way for them to empower themselves. And providing that is, is only doing good for your team and only serving them. So I was really happy to see that as a recommendation. Uh, and, and yes, yeah, she does have five. Ex- that wasn't just the only one. Yeah. So she has five excuses that she says we tell ourselves when we're trying to lie to ourselves that we're going to do better later. Uh, she's, she's like, you know, we're, we're master storytellers. We keep telling ourselves fanciful stories to motivate ourselves to get vast amount of work done in a small amount of time. And, and her, her conclusion here is, is, You're not going to get that much better, right? But becoming cognizant of this and using tools and processes to, to, to cut this off in, in its tracks is, is going to help you actually get things done, right? So the, the first excuse she brings up is my heavy workload is just temporary. And any, any, this is actually something I struggle with too. So what I have done recently in, in my job is, is, I implemented a brand new pipeline uh, for a, a patching process, basically, for, for patching servers, keeping them up to date, yada, yada, yada. Uh, and I just automated everything out of it that I could. So so my end state, my, my determination, right, what I was determined to do was to find a state, to get to a state where it was virtually hands off. And, and I'm, I'm practically there now, right? But that doesn't mean that my heavy workload has gone away. Where right. I was putting that together and planning for the future and architecting that system and making sure it was able to handle edge cases and stuff like that, I was deep into that, right? Now I've got other problems that I'm deep into. Now, granted, they are better problems to have. They're higher level problems. There's... Uh, a bit more interpersonal problems, right? Dealing with other teams and, and getting coordination and implementing new features, right? We're, we're not reactive anymore. We're proactive. So it's, it's a good problem to have, but it doesn't mean that my workload has gotten any lighter. It just means that that aspect of it 
is not the majority of what I'm doing. I'm able to take on other projects and do other things. Uh, so one of the, one of the lies that's easy to tell ourselves, you know, if if we're like, well, I can I can do a lot of things. I can, I'm going to plan to do five times what I did today because I'm not going to have to right. deal with that, right? Or or next year I'm going to get so much stuff done. Is is the lie you're telling yourself is my heavy workload is just temporary? That's just a lie. Don't listen to it. It's it's not going to work. Uh, the the next one she touches on is that the next time will be easier. Uh, what she points to here is that there could be things that pop up that you're not ready for, right? It's those little two minute tasks, um, that you need to do throughout the day and those, those little things. And it's, it's a lot easier to create a buffer for yourself. And, and this is something that I've been doing. It's not that I'm saying no. When someone asks me to do something, it's like, Hey, can you get this done? My first Response is not yes or no, because either way, that's going to be bad, right? It's going to be bad if I say yes, because it's not there immediately. It's going to be bad if I say no, because they asked me to, and I'm not serving them by saying no. The way I'm able to best serve them is to say, hey, when do you need this done by? And then you're able to say, I need this done by Monday. And it's like, well, I've actually got stuff the rest of this week, and I've got a couple weekend events. Um, I'm not going to be able to get it done Monday. How about Wednesday? Right. Because I know I can actually probably do it Monday morning, but I'm not going to say I can have it to you by Monday afternoon because there's going to be something that pops up that my manager is going to hit me up about and say, hey, I need like a report you to report on this. Get this to me by the end of the day. And that's what I'm working on for three hours. Oh, well. So having that built in buffer not only alleviates that disappointment on, on the other end, but. You're also setting expectations. What we talked about, why Uber is, is, has been so powerful is because not only do they give you an accurate timeline or, or like a, a, a accurate estimation, a, a good estimation, they also give you updates and over deliver consistently. You'll get your ride to you quicker, right? If I can get the product, you know, the, a, a half a day before I promised it and say, Hey, by the way, I was able to finish this early. Here, here, here right. you go. That doesn't hurt anyone, right? Setting expectations and failing to deliver hurts people. Yeah, I like the Uber example. It's like, I think we touched on it. You know, taxis had always been around, but it's that immediate feedback on, hey, it's, you know, 20 minutes away when it actually could be 15, you know, and then as it gets closer and closer, it's, hey, you know, 10 minutes away could be you know 11 or 12 or what or it, they'll say 11 or 12 and it could be 10 and then it shows up and it's like here and you're like oh you know this is great perfect they're on you know and they could have been sitting out there for maybe a minute or two then it says they're here and you're getting that immediate feedback and you're saying oh well look at that you know kind of that over delivery basically versus the taxi it's i'll be there in 30 to 40 and there is radio silence until they show up exactly exactly so did any of them stick out to you? I think I think the very first one was the one that stood out to me. The the heavy workload is just temporary because, like I said, that's something I struggle with. I wrote up a short story recently, and I posted it in a couple of the, the discords that I'm in. It was about how I raced a train and I lost. Uh, I do sprint workouts, uh, and yeah. I do them uh, on the gravel next to the train tracks because it's just a very easy it's a it's a flat service it's it's earth it's not you know concrete it, it does it's easier on my joints and and whatnot kind of strengthens my ankle as I'm running and you know whatever so a lot of benefits there and it's very straight very easy to see where I'm going and 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 put landmarks and say okay I got here this time let me get further next time and of course as you're running next to a train track you would expect a train to be there every once in a while so right. i was i was waiting until the day until you know i was able to to race a train and and i i finally got my chance and i you know I walked up to the starting line and and waited for it to to hit the crossing uh before yeah. I, before i took off right and i'm just i'm just hearing it roll up behind me and i'm just i'm just running my heart out because i know that train is coming faster than i could ever run but i'm like i'm i'm, I'm just gonna beat it right it's, yeah I, I'm, I'm gonna do it and um, train catches up to me. I see it out like the corner of my eye. You know, the the conductor's like like honking his horn or whatever. I hear the I hear the toot and it rushes by me, right? And then then you just hear this overwhelming just just it's it's loud. A, a train is loud. It's big. Totally. It's massive. Totally. It's got a huge 
bit of momentum to it. You just, you feel the presence of this thing clicking and clacking along the tracks and you get buffeted by the wind as it's, as it's going by you, as car after car is going by you. Um, and, and at that point, right, I, I realized that my motivation was, was wearing out because I, you know, I had already lost at that point. And, you know, even, even though the wind was, you know, pushing me forward and, and kind of like, you know, all my senses were on edge because there was this huge thing right next to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. But it's like that, that adrenaline surge only lasted so long. And at that point, like I, I started like being acutely aware of my body, you know, my, my, my breathing, you know, keep, keeping my, keeping my elbows in, right. In, and, and, and good form and, and, and shoulders back. And that, at that point, I shifted from motivation into dedication, and the the dedication it 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 couldn't have mattered whether the, the the train was there or I had the most you know banging playlist you know in in my headphones uh, if it was you know sunny or or, or cloudy or rainy or or, or a beautiful day it, yeah. it, it didn't matter right I was the only one who was responsible for for getting myself and pushing myself for the rest of that sprint. Right there, yeah. there was nothing. There was nothing anymore that could have motivated me to keep on going. It was it was pure dedication at that point. Uh, and then, and then the reason the reason I I raced the train is because my goal was to beat the train. Now, probably not gonna probably not gonna ever get that goal. Right? Uh, I would love to to be able to have a good time for a quarter mile. Right? Um, or, right. or or like, I would love to be able to go flat out for a half mile to have the the endurance, the you know the the, the cardiovascular endurance to go flat out for a half mile. That's that's probably that's more hard. so. That's probably more so my my actual goal. But I had to keep that determination in my mind, right? And and that's what's driving me. That that continues to drive me, right? That's that's why I keep going out there because I know incrementally I'm getting closer and closer to there, and one day I'm going to hit that, right? That's that's my you know, I'm, I'm determined to get there. That's, that's my goal. Right. And if my goal is that I have a heavy workload and future me is not going to have a heavy workload, I'm lying to myself. The entire reason that I'm doing all this work is based on a lie. And, th- and that's never a good place to be. You want to be somewhere right. that's, that's moral, that's reproducible across many cycles ad infinitum, right? You want to be able to do something over and over again. If, if something's based on a lie, it falls down at some point. So if, if my determination, if I'm determined, if my goal is that I'm not going to have a heavy workload ever, right? Then I'm going to be constantly disappointed. I'm never going to hit that. Sooner or later, I'm going to hit burnout. Like there's, there's just a lot of problems with that. And right. I need to take a different approach to why, the why, why am I doing these things? What, and it can't be because I don't want to have a heavy workload anymore because I'm always going to be having work to do. Totally. It, uh, it takes us back to, uh, to three questions. Uh, autonomy, mastery, purpose. Yeah. Is, I mean, is that, is that yeah, what that is? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Autonomy and mastery and purpose. Yeah. Yeah. It leads you back to I, not three questions, but those three you want to call them factors, three dri- driving factors, factors. Yeah, for why you do something. Like, yeah. you know, right. I've been harping on, maybe not here in the podcast, but I have harped on the difference between motivation and dedication in the past, right? You can't rely on motivation. You're not going to wake up every morning motivated to do something, right? You need right. a little dedication for when things get tough, you just kind of plow through them. Right. Yeah, when when you know your body starts feeling tired, it's not like you stop. You you push yourself to get to the next level. And I think I was missing that determination part of it too. That is a good point too. I I want to see how that factors into the autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Let me let me think about that. I lost in the end, by the way. Yeah, I didn't I didn't beat the train. To a train? Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, trains move pretty quick. <laughs> There are there are two more. Uh, she she has two more lies that we tell ourselves here. Uh, one of them is I will collect immediate rewards. 
And the other is, without me, this work will be poor quality. So if any of those resonate with you, uh, feel free to follow the link in the show notes. Uh, the title of the article is Be More Realistic About the Time You Have, and that's in the Harvard Business Review. So I highly recommend uh, checking it out. Uh, there's there's just a, a, a good write-up. And uh, if you have any comments on it, we did post it in the subreddit. So feel free to, uh, to drop us a line uh, if you have any other takes that we haven't explored today. Uh, but Jack, I think at this point, uh, I want to hear your take on free BSD 13's close call. Yeah. So I want to call it NetGate's close call okay. after, uh, kind of going back through a second time here. So I want to make this brief and I want to cover kind of what I kind of found as maybe key points or stuff that kind of stuck out to me. Jim Thompson is the CEO of NetGate. Um, and for those that don't know, so NetGate runs NetGate runs a lot of enterprise software, but they also put out PFSense, which is built on FreeBSD, which is kind of um, uh, it's firewall. It's basically a firewall, uh, home firewall solution. Uh, so Jim Thompson and NetGate went to uh, this guy named Matthew Macy. They went okay, so they went to Matthew Macy here, uh, who's I guess a kernel engineer. And they said to him, hey, can you port WireGuard into the kernel for us? To and the free BSD kernel. To the from... free BSD kernel, okay. right. Because I think it's it, it's it's in user space right now, which runs fine. It's that's already in that's already in there. Uh, they wanted NetGate wanted a kernel version of it. So he said, sure. And when they signed this contract, nothing it was almost no strings attached, I want to call it. There were, it was, uh, you know, get it done on your own time. There's no real timeline. You know, we'll kind of just accept it when it comes in. Well, sure enough, <laughs> this is kind of what happened. He wrote all this code up and he just kind of submitted it in. NetGate, I guess, didn't even give it the once over. Backported it to PFSense 2.5 in their version of free SB, free BSD. Um, so they pushed out pfsense 25 with in a nutshell a bunch of garbage code they push it out you can read out you can read it it's the code quality is just terrible now not uh, to not to disparage him yeah. but it's 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 stuff that i would expect hastily put together code to contain for any kind of kernel code like this you would expect a better job especially approved kernel code maybe right. a first rough draft you're like oh yeah why did you put this here oh pfft. Yeah, that's, I meant to, and then you can have that conversation, but it sounds like right. that conversation and, didn't even get had. Well, this is where I'd say FreeBSD's close call was. It's NetGate kind of backported it and said, all right, we're shipping it. It's fine. Never really gave it the once over. Now it got to FreeBSD's release, 13's release, and the guy who actually wrote WireGuard, I think his name is Jason, looked at it and said, whoa, 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 whoa. No, no, no. This is not, no, you can't do this. This isn't right he went back and actually rewrote a lot of the code um, to work. But, you know, for NetGate to be release backporting it, releasing it without giving it any kind of once over and then having it, you know, get uh, pull requested into FreeBSD 13 and them saying, Hey, no, you, this is not good. The, the quality of this is just terrible. You, what do you, what were you thinking and having to have it rewritten? It Really, it's a, just a bad look on NetGate's part, if you ask me. Because they um, were they were pushing this code without vetting they just, it. They just backported it without any without questions. So you kind of have to qu look at the integrity and go, okay, NetGate, come on, like this, the, really the ball's in your court on this one. As much as you want to blame, you know, Matt Macy for writing writing the code, I'm sure he was just under stress. I think he mentioned he was. You know, kind of tired, just ready. I think he even said he was just ready to be done with it at one point. So he submitted it in, and NetGate just said okay. So I mean, you've you've been in that situation before, though, because I remember when we were working through our issues with the notification system. Yeah, yeah. You get to the state where you just don't know where. You know, you run into a problem and. Luckily, I had a team, you know, you're up here reviewing the code or else you just kind of get you end up with the wrong solution in mind and then writing the wrong solution out. It's like that level of burnout. Yeah. Yeah. That level of burnout. You do just kind of get there after looking at the logic so many times saying, you know, bashing your head in and saying, all right, 
this should be doing this this way. There are many reasons we have peer reviews, and this is absolutely a valid reason to push peer reviews because we're all totally. humans and we, yeah. you know, we're, we're all motivated by different reasons, right? And, and going back to that, his motivation apparently ran out by the end of that because he was tired and he hit burnout, right? Because, you know, whatever motivation he had wasn't exactly lining up with, with where he was moving towards. And he's like, look, I'm just, I'm done with this, you know, and, and he didn't have the people behind him to, to sit him down and talk with him and say, what's going yeah. on? Can I help? Right. How can I help? Right. End of the day, we're all human. And if his, if right. his determination was being subverted, right, if, if he was hit and burnout for some reason, if, if he couldn't get where he needed to be or, or he wasn't getting what he needed and no one sat him down to communicate with him and he was working in a black box uh then yeah. then yeah you're 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 going to have problems and the problems that manifested themselves here was bad code and vulnerabilities and you know that that is a that is a unfortunately not a technical problem because you can have all of the automated tests you want you can have all the whatever but as if you're pushing in new code you know, and you have the same person writing the tests right. and the code and <laughs> yeah. you just make it all pass. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, I, I, I don't fault the guy, um, but I do believe that the process he was in uh, should have been scrutinized a bit more uh, because the, the, the backporting of that wasn't wasn't great. And if there, there could have been a lot of different people along the process that could have spoke out uh, right. and, and, and they didn't. They didn't. Uh, whatever approvals this had to go through, they got rubber stamped. That's that's apparent here. So take a look at what you're doing, and this is this is the frustrating part of processes is when it becomes a burden, people start working their way around them or just rubber stamping, and it's just TPS reports at the end of the day. So uh, there there always needs to be a balance, and unfortunately. This is a very this this became a very public situation where yeah. that process fell flat on its face. Could have been handled a lot better. I, I think jumping right into news, actually, I think we hop right into Rails with that. There's a gem out there. Shared my memfo was under GPL two, and my magic was under MIT. And so you get into that hairy licensing topic of hey, you're releasing GPL code under the MIT license. You know, MIT is what I want to call the loosest out there. And GPL2 is, I think you have to provide attribution as well as thing released off of GPL2 has to be GPL2. The problem with so the GPL, though, is that it's viral. So it affects any code that it's bundled with. Right, right. So basically, that... That gem, uh, my magic would have had to have been released as GPL two, and it wasn't. So they got into that hairy licensing fiasco, is what I'll call it. With that being said, they pushed out a fix for it actually pretty quick. Um, they were able to update. I think it's three seven zero point three point seven and zero point four point zero that were pushed out without the GPL code. Um, I think. I don't know if it was a licensing switch that happened, um, but I was looking at the commit uh, and it appeared that they took out uh, any kind of GPL code uh, that was causing issues. Um, so we, we did run into that. This happened like Wednesday. Hey, we were able to work around it, get the... It's, it's, it took me 12 hours. Let's just not gloss <laughs> over that we were able to work around it. You, hey, I think I think part of that was setting up a development environment. That was about 90% <laughs> of it, to be to be fair. <laughs> yeah, because I, I pulled down a uh, gem file lock uh, and ran a bundle install, and it looked like everything just kind of added in. <laughs> and sure, I'm sure there was a bunch more, a bunch more in the back end taking place there. but Well, um, here's where I started off. Um, if if you want to make any of your Ruby developers cringe is I started manually editing the gem file dot lock. Oh, no. Yeah. See, no. <laughs> that is, you're making me cringe right now. <laughs> oh, God. You should just delete it and regenerate it. That's, I'm sure it would. I, I think you would that was fun. about hour four. I, I got to that Run point. Into the same result right there. <laughs> delete the gem file dot lock and just regenerate it. <laughs> yeah. 
So, but but you know, we obviously this is this was a very far-reaching issue. Using a GPL file as a source makes your whole code base a derived work. GPL is both a blessing and a curse. One of the interesting things is that this affected a lot of projects. Like even even we were affected. We we'll used basically nothing, right? And this yeah. is a core Rails utility. Uh, right. So almost every Rails project was affected by this affected during great. that during that time frame. Like so. Any CI CD pipelines, anything that's automatically running is going to be hit by this. You're, you're going to have these, these issues coming through where it, things are just not going to build, right? And it's just going to be that whatever day that was, just stuff started to not build. And, and I'm glad I actually ran across this before I encountered the issue. So I actually had What's this that, already Ed? in the stack. I had this article in the stack because I'm like, oh, this is going to be great. I get to, you know, make fun yeah, of Jack yeah. for this. And then I end up spending like 12 hours trying to fix the stupid trying to thing. Fix it, yeah. So joke's on me. But yeah, did you want to jump into uh, some other releases out there? Yeah. The only other news items we have are a couple of releases. Uh, Bitwarden, re- Bitwarden RS uh, released 1.20.0. Uh, not a whole lot in there uh implemented send functionality now that's that's cool uh updated web vault to 2.19.0 so you got a new web vault version uh different fixes diagnosis page and updated dependencies so really really just mundane release um but that means we'll be bumping up to 1.19 which i think had a uh quite a bit in there 1.18 to 1.19 was a big jump yeah that was a big jump that was a big jump for sure uh firefly 3 uh released 5.5.1 uh the big change here is i think a lot of the api changes uh were made to make the api more consistent uh, and just a lot of issues fixed so there's just a lot of a lot of notes here. A lot of issues closed. Uh, love seeing this. I absolutely love seeing this. You know, and 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 you see stuff like uh, issue four thousand three hundred thirty four, support for Portuguese. That's awesome, right? Yeah. The maintainer of Firefly three does not know Portuguese. I, I I can tell you that right now. But someone in the community stepped up and said, "Hey, I will translate, translate. everything that you have in here into Portuguese." That's awesome. That's that's someone volunteering their time and effort and saying. I will absolutely, you know, go through this for you. And it, it may take them a trivial amount of time to do. It, it may take them a couple days, but it it helps a lot of people. So I'm, I right. love seeing that. I love seeing those little things in addition to the big API fixes and stuff like that. Uh, there's just a lot you can do in open source, even if you can't code. Uh, and then WordPress 5.7 came out. This actually came out March 9th, and I completely skipped over it in the last episode. Uh, did not touch on, on it at all for some reason. So I wanted to circle back here uh, today. Uh, updates to the editor. Um, trying to make it more uh, functional. Um, trying to make it more without having to include anything custom. Um, and, and just, it looks like a lot of fine tuning and, and minimizing some of those paper cuts. So once again, you know, WordPress will be bumping up to five, six. Uh, so if, if that's what you're running, uh, go ahead and, and give five, six a read up and we'll let you know when, when five, six is going to be promoted. Uh, then before we jump into our integration discussion, uh, I wanted to, talk about our Q1 wrap up. Uh, so Jack and I are going to be getting together actually this weekend. So Jack's going to yeah. be heading up this up way, here, yeah. spending a couple days hanging out, going through what we did in Q1, planning out some, uh, some Q2 stuff. We we're talking, what was it on Monday? I think we were talking about uh, different things that we personally would like to see in Q2. So cool stuff uh, coming ahead. I'd say, I'd say if we're able to pull this off, um, the product that we have at the start of Q3 is going to be pretty cool. It's gonna be awesome, yeah. Yeah. So awesome. let's 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 try for that. Uh, but we are still on the track of going through our next cloud walkthrough. Uh, so Jack was able to put together some notes on the groupware. I think what was it last episode? You went over kind of built-in apps, and so this episode, group. I'm gonna talk about groupware, uh, which is 
it, it boils down to four or five uh, applications, which end up being, you know, mail, being a mail client, uh, calendar, contacts, and they offer something similar to Camboard, which is their deck service. Essentially, you log in, and I think these come out of the box ready to be enabled. I want to walk through kind of each service. Uh, I think really the ben- the main benefit you get from all of these is you have your own data. Main takeaway is that you you have your own data, right? It's not Facebook data. It's not Apple's data. It's not Google's data. I just go to, you know, bang there. With calendar, you can create and share multiple calendars. You can integrate calendar resources uh, with WebCal. And then you can book re book resources through a busy view or plan a talk meeting. I, I didn't talk on talk. It's down there as a uh, group where it's kind of in there um, with calendar. The one thing I really like is being able to create multiple calendars. Uh, this is what I usually do on my own calendars, you know, a birthday calendar, a holidays calendar, you know, a personal calendar, a work calendar. And that way I'm able to split out and view every day in how I'm going to kind of treat the day, if that makes sense, versus having a calendar that is booked, you know, day to day, minute to minute with every single thing. I mean, that's great sometimes, but it's to me, it's overwhelming. I just know it is overwhelming to look at a calendar that is booked, you know, eight to midnight. What I do find helpful is I can import my work calendar into Nextcloud, and I can also import my Canboard calendar into Nextcloud. And actually probably the opposite of you because I, I love seeing both of those on one, and then I see where my workday stops and like where my uh, my personal day, my workout session, and then like, you know, Bible yeah. study or yeah. whatever begins because they're on two separate calendars, right? Uh, and, yeah. and by that, I mean like they're highlighted with two separate colors. They're easily distinguishable. It says this is your Camboard calendar. This is your that. office yeah, calendar. Same board, yeah. yeah. Same page. Yeah. yeah. And then I can hide one if I don't care about it. If I'm just looking at, you know, what. That's, that's, what, so that's what I do. I split it up and I say, hey, I don't want to see any work after, you know, 5, 530. I'm just yeah. turn off the count, turn off that view. What am I, you know, what's going on? Right. Yeah, yeah exactly. I, I, I did want to say I'm intentionally not touching on any kind of mobile integrations right now that will come later yeah a whole separate uh talk on that i was gonna leave webcal uh for the next episode i think uh, yeah we talked about but just notice i guess this is just to let everyone know inform everybody that it is out there yeah the integration and the webcal integration is the webcal integration yeah you can uh basically as it's applicable here is that you can import calendars as we were talking about you can also export calendars from nextcloud diving into contacts uh with nextcloud contacts you can track your birthdays okay you can do that with calendar uh you can share your address books with your team and you can sync your contacts with phones and other devices um hmm, really i wonder where much- that would have come in handy <laughs> <laughs> uh that's good for mobile okay well we're not going to dive into that the one thing i will say with contacts was um I was recently trying to pull all my contacts off my phone. I have an iPhone. And honestly, it's very difficult. I I think you can link it up to NextCloud and back up to NextCloud. I didn't get it working the way I wanted. Hmm. That makes sense. So uh, I think it was because it was already using something else. Sure enough, I think it was using Hotmail or something. Um, so sure enough, I log into my Hotmail account. I'm like, what's going on here? They got all my contacts from my phone. I'm like, okay, well, let me just export this and delete everything. So sure enough, export it. You can just pull it as a CSV. Um, then I had to download this fancy widget tool from, uh, GitHub to turn the CSV into Cal card or it's oh, like, okay. a, yeah, yeah. A uh, card dev, card, 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 card dev. Yeah. yeah so it's card dev. And then card dev into Nextcloud. A little bit of a process, kind of. That's 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 a fun kind of stuff. Like yeah, 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 yeah. Well, and and to be fair, 
if that's something that anyone were to run across where they're having a similar issue, that's where you call us and we're like, oh, we're the nerds who know how to do that. We, so. Oh, I already I did this once before. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It exports as a CSV. It's a pain in pain. It's a pain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So. Um, so, no, that's funny. That's funny that you had to do that. I actually had some kind of setup issues, too. Uh, I I don't remember where I documented it, probably in my blog or whatever. But, yeah, that that was that was fun to do. What it also integrates with, and if we can just skip down there for a second, but it also card dev, right? It, it, it's a it's a context um, format, which is a standard like a web standard it'll store you know name phone number and also like email address right which comes in super handy when i want to sync to my desktop email client right so i actually have my desktop email client synced to nextcloud with my contacts and also nextcloud has their mail application so you can just we can we can roll right into to that because that is exactly where where context comes in handy yeah. So, okay. So with Nextcloud, you can, I have some bullets here, but it's a mail client in your web browser. Yeah. So instead of going to, you know, every, so you have multiple email accounts, you log into each service, you know, we'll just say, you know, Yahoo, Gmail, Fastmail, you know, any kind of webmail, ser- you know, client service, any kind of just web service there or provider, you, instead of logging into each one, you basically can go to Nextcloud and say, all right, I have all my inboxes here. Now, it's an option. It's absolutely an option. I'd recommend it for on the go per se, but for me using a desktop, I just do, I do like my mail, just built in mail client. Do you use whatever the MacBook has for you? Or? It, that's okay. what, that's what's there. Okay. Uh, but I do have Thunderbird, uh, on my okay. other desktop. And I'm actually, I, lo- I actually, I love Thunderbird. Oh man, dude, like, I'm, I'm a mail spring proponent. I tried, at this mail, point. I tried mail spring. It, I don't know what it was. It was just, and even from even me saying this from Thunderbird, Mailspring felt clunky. Mailspring felt clunky. Hmm. I don't know if it was just the version I had. It was. Is it an Element app? Electron. Electron. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I feel the Java. I, I don't know if it was something about the rendering that was just. Hmm. I had a couple, I was moving boxes. I don't know if it was my seat. It could have been, it could have been user error. I'm not going to sit here and say it wasn't. I was moving a couple boxes, dialog boxes, and I moved them over and the text wouldn't show up. And this happened a couple times. And I said, nope, Thunderbird. I'm defaulting back to Thunderbird. All right. Yeah, that's Uh, fair. That's fair. You gave it a shot. That's, that's all I can ask for. Thunderbird gets it done. Now, this, this is what I would say is that on the go kind of mobile, um, option you're able to just sign into next cloud and say hey you know what i need every inbox and there it is um yeah i would recommend if anyone's still using the web interface for their provider to not um use, totally use, yeah, I'd make that exact same recommendation <laughs> use a desktop client use a mobile client uh and and sync all of your inboxes down to that client so that you're you're using your one client yeah, for all this yeah, right. way right. easier way easier and then just next cloud just offers a way to do that on a server it's like easy. through the through easy. the browser so like that would be that would be probably my third way of accessing mail if i didn't have my uh client uh desktop client if i didn't have my mobile client then i'd go to my next cloud instance now I believe what you came across was that a lot of mail providers like for you to use an application yeah. password yeah. rather than your login password. So even for MailSpring and so even going back to Thunderbird, some applications uh, have like a pop up where they say, hey, all right, you can log in using this service it pops up saying, hey, log in via, you know, however. Let me let me back up and 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 kind of dive into application password. So just just to sp- set expectations, right? Yeah. Because you set up your email client once and you're done, right? So you go through that hassle and you're like, you look back, and you're like, man, that was a hassle, and then not learn anything from it, right? So what? Because you do it so quickly. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So the so the first thing to know is that you can have a login password to like your your Hotmail or your Fastmail. Or whatever, what what have you? Yeah, yeah. Then the 
login password is going to be separate from the password that you actually supply to the client. You're you're going to you're going to go into Hotmail and you're going to say, "Hey, by the way, I have a new client that I want to start receiving email." And Hotmail is going to say, "All right, great, but we're not going to let you use that login password because that would be insecure." Your default password, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to have you log in with a separate password. Here it is, and it's going to generate a password for you. And then you take that and you give that password to the mail client. So that's that's what an application password is. And a lot of email services are going to use that. Um, a lot a lot of them that a lot of them are going to use it. So just be yeah. aware. Um, yeah. So basically, I ran into that. When I was setting it up, because it's exactly what you said. How often do you set up a mail client? You don't. You set it up usually once and it just works, TM. Um, but basically, I had I was setting it up and ran into that. Uh, I think it was Fastmail. Said, hey, no, no, no. Do not use your login password. Go in, log in, generate an app password, and just use the app password. So it was easy enough to get up and running. Um, the one note I'll make on Nextcloud Mail, uh, similar to what I would compare to Deck to Canboard, is that you're not getting the full feature-rich uh, client email. You kind of have to search around for what you want to do, which more or less could be user error, right? Um, but overall, it does. You're able to read read your email. Um, does yeah. its job. Uh. Deck, I don't want to dive too deep into. Basically, it's yeah, it's a Kanban style task board. Um, you're able to drag and drop cards, assign them to team members. So I guess anyone in Nextcloud, you're able to assign it to, and then um, you're able to. This is it. It more or less seemed like a checklist, uh, and to do list than it did a board. Um, everything was kind of recognized as actually a list. Did it have so, swim lanes? That I had, I'd have to go. I'd have to go back and check. When I went and uh, opened it up, played with it a little bit, created a couple tasks, created a couple lists. I did it, everything. Kind of fell under default, and I think that's why I said it felt like a to-do list more than anything. Yeah, because I, I I see a lot of other board software that's that's not specifically like Kanban, right? So you're you're looking at Trello or Jira or what have you. They underutilize swim lanes by default. And I, that's concerning to me because swim lanes are very powerful uh, and they, they, they help a lot. So I would be, I'd be interested to see if, if deck has that functionality. Yeah. And then the last group where application here uh, is talk, which I know you had said you've used. I, I do remember experimenting with this once and then never touching it again. Never. Yeah. I just never. Yeah. Um, well, especially uh, since there's so many different ways to communicate, to to do, you know, calls. Oh, my gosh. There's a, a thousand messaging apps out there. There's a thousand ways to call somebody now. It's anymore. Well, I, RTC yeah, is I, out I, there. I think what um, you want to do, though, is what is the benefit of using one over the other, especially if you have to break it up, right? right. The, the cool thing about Talk is that it's integrated with Nextcloud. So if you're giving presentations that you have stored in Nextcloud, you can present using Talk. Like you, yeah. It has yeah. those types of integrations that are, are so close-knit because it is developed in the same ecosystem. That was the big one that stuck out to me was that, you know, being able to present over in web, I, I think they called it web conferencing was the other big one. Nextcloud provides end-to-end -end encrypted audio and video calls, uh, easy screen sharing, kind of what Andrew was talking about, and for web conferencing, and then the again what you were also talking about the integration with Nextcloud files and other groupware. So, con you, you're able to call your contacts within Nextcloud uh, that are on Nextcloud using Talk. That's all I had for groupware. The one other tip i had for groupware and just apps in general before we dive into you know full third party applications was when and we're going to work on this is when we upgrade our next cloud instance sometimes next cloud apps also need to be updated before they're before you're able to see them we actually them again. we actually merged this this is actually a oh, functionality okay. that's already there but yes yeah, so in the event that 
this happens. It's good to in know. In the event you're running into an issue where, hey, my the calendar app isn't showing up. Hey, the contacts app isn't there anymore. Hey, talk isn't showing up. Any of these apps aren't showing up. It's a matter of going in and in the applications page and updating the application itself to match with your version of Nextcloud. Now we we have a patch out there that uh, will automatically update uh, them for you. But in the event that you're still running into new issue, that's the first place to check. Obviously, we have the documentation out there. Um, I'm going to point right to it. Um, but that was something of note as well as the app passwords, which we already touched on. But that's everything I have for group where is there anything else that stuck out maybe that i missed anything you wanted to point to no no thanks for putting this together uh it was it was good to uh get an overview of what's available and how it might work yeah yep absolutely um i think that's the goal i think we t- talked about uh for both the podcast and the documentation basically just pointing you know there's upstream documentation out there but we're here to provide you hey this is what you can do with the service with you know so with nextcloud and groupware uh with that i think we are ready to dive into our grab bag today yeah we are i need to grab the book for the grab bag hold on one second ah, okay okay yeah so today is another book review we're we're gonna dive into the book Primal Leadership: uh, Learning to Lead with Emotional Intelligence. So, for anyone who's interested and is watching the video, that's what it looks like, and it's written by Daniel Goleman uh, with Richard Boyantis and Annie McKee. It's a very very long book. Uh, I was gonna ask. I, I when you were grabbing it, I didn't know it was paperback. I thought it was. Uh hardcover and yeah yeah i'm looking right now that is a meaty book (laughs) it is it is uh it's i have seen critiques where where they talk about it being overly wordy uh especially in the prescriptive uh back end of the book so once again you got to prescribe something after laying out a a um uh foundation so so that's what they they decided to go into yeah i took away a couple things from this that weren't necessarily the the main crux of the book um but i'm gonna i'm gonna go over the main crux of the book so we can understand where we're coming from and then i'm gonna dive into some of the takeaways that i had so like i said it was a meeting book so i grabbed a couple summaries off the internet that i thought did it did it justice uh there was just this person Heather Farron, uh, she did a, a write-up, uh, an evaluation. Actually, I think it's really good. I, I pulled a lot of good talking points out of her evaluation. So if you're you're interested in what we go over today, a lot of it is actually kind of spearheaded by by the way she categorized stuff. Um, but she, she summed it up with uh, the quote of, uh, the fundamental task of leaders is to prime good feeling in those they lead. That occurs when a leader creates resonance, a reservoir of positivity that frees the best in people. At its root, then, the primal job of leadership is emotional. Now, this this absolutely comes back to the whole motivation, the autonomy, mastery, and purpose talk, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, But this adds a little bit more depth into that. We're getting a little bit deeper into it and saying, how are we addressing the autonomy, mastery, and purpose problems on an emotional level. And so in the in the power moves uh right up Lucio goes into goes into primal leadership and in, in saying that that Daniel argues that the number one trait of any good leader is his emotional intelligence and his ability to connect and engage with his followers. The book is also famous for Goldman's six types of leaders whom he describes in detail. So, uh, maybe not six types of leaders, but six types of leadership. Uh, and, and Daniel uses that term resonant leaders, uh, to describe leaders who understand human nature and leverage their emotional intelligence of, of those six leadership styles to connect with people and get the most out of them. Um, Another quote out of it is that let resonant leaders embrace emotions and humanity and dissonant leaders 
instead don't understand or actively try to cut out the human side of business, right? So the main crux of this book is you need to be a resonant leader. You need to positively move your team in a direction with your own emotional intelligence. Uh, sure. Right. So the the authors break down uh, the six types of leadership into resonant and dissonant. Uh, the resonant ones are visionary, affiliative, democratic, and coaching. Uh, so visionary, uh, setting a vision and, and getting the whole team uh, bought into that vision. Uh, the affiliative oh. is... Uh, getting people on your side, becoming, you know, one of them and, and uh, which is very close to the democratic where you take everyone's considerations into consideration when doing anything. Uh, yeah. And then, and then coaching is having a one-on-one -on -one personal mentor type relationship with someone. So these are all ways encourage resonant leadership that, that you're moving your team in an emotionally positive direction. Uh, there are two he called out that he said are dissonant, but that are effective in certain times. So he said pace setting is one and commanding is another. Uh, pace setting is, especially when you have a lot of highly skilled people, uh, you're, you're pushing people. You're saying, keep up with my pace. Like this is, right. this is what we're doing and this is the amount of excellence that I expect and none less than this. Uh, the other one is commanding, which is great in emergency situations, uh, creator we events. Need you, you, you right. need, you need leadership to direct you on, on what to do. There are very few situations in where these work and they both do not work over long periods of time. Sure. So those two dissonant ones are, are meant to be used sparingly. Any questions so far? That commanding one, I really, it makes sense though. And I'm really glad you pointed it out as a, uh, used it during time of emerge. Yeah. I guess during emergency is, is that what you kind of, or incident? Yes. Um, Basically, you need someone running point on incident, incident response saying, all right, this is what's going on right now. I need this, 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 and this to resolve whatever issue we're running into. Because if you kind of set, all right, this is our vision for fixed, you know, you might get there, but you might have however many people working in a different way versus pointing and saying, do this, do this, you do this, you do this, you do this. You do this it's very much easier to manage. Yeah, there are ways yeah. to deal with that long term in in a way that promotes resonance. Uh, but especially in an emergency situation, you don't have the time to sit down and and talk it out with people. <laughs> right, right. No, <laughs> uh, no. But no questions. I I really like how they it split up. That you know he didn't only just list resonant, or he didn't only just list dissonant. That there's actually a breakup or a breakdown of the types of leadership. Moving on from there, they touched on the emotional intelligence domain. So they, they spent a little bit talking about that kind of around the leadership styles, uh, those, those six that we just went over. What I want to focus in on are these emotional intelligence domains. I have the social competencies spelled out here. Those, those are the ones that I am personally interested in. So those are the ones that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, they have them broken down into four. Uh, so the first two are personal competencies. The first two are self-awareness and self-management. So if those resonate with you, if that's something that you think you need to start taking a look at, uh, I would recommend making a beeline to that. But today, I'm going to be talking about the social competencies rather than the personal competencies. So the social competencies are self-awareness, uh, broken down, which are empathy, organizational awareness, and service, and relationship management, which is inspirational leadership, influence, developing others, change catalyst, conflict management, and teamwork and collaboration. Right. So these are the things I'm most interested in. Uh, these are the ones that I am currently trying to dive in and, and, and get a grasp on, a, a really good grasp on. So to dig in deep here, I'm going to start talking about the, the social awareness part of it. And I'm specifically going to talk about the service aspect. So this is, this is recognizing and meeting follower, client, or customer needs. Right. Uh, 
just the first two recognizing and meeting i mean there's there's a reason why we set the expectations at the beginning of our canboard tasks right we set the why we set the done and we set the how right because we need to recognize what these are and we need to make sure that when we're done we're actually meeting them right so so talking about how do we get these these ideas across to one another because as you said, Jack, you know, when you're in, in emergency situations, people could have the same recognition of the need, right? Um, but how to meet the need is going to be different through everyone. And that's something you need to level set in a team. As a team, you're going to be working on stuff together. If you are going to be working on stuff together, you need to be level set there. Uh, so how, and, and how we do that is important. So how we roll out change. And, and this is, these are my notes here. How we roll out change is just as important as the quality or excellence of the tool. And that's, that's a little bit of a hit to my pride because, you know, I, I see everything that I'm using and I see, I see the excellence that you can use it. Yeah. I can see the poor ways you can use it. I can see the good ways that you can use it. Right. And, and I dive right into, you know, my, my gut reaction is to dive right into, how do totally. I use this tool well, right? And and that's why I dive into settings a lot of the time as, as we talked about, right? I like to go in and tinker and I like to say, hey, you know, I think I can make this, you know, work a little bit better for me or I'm going to add another swim lane. I think that's missing in here, another column. Uh, because I, I, I think the quality, the excellence of the tool is going to, is, is what dri- drives me, right? But also important is how we roll out the change, right? This is because people's emotions have a greater effect on the success of a rollout than people's intellect, right? I'm going to quote you, and and I love this quote from the fifth episode of the podcast, and I know I clipped it for the, the promo episode, but but you just had this, like, right in the middle, we're talking on something, you know, we're, we're talking about, like, like how you use Canboard, yeah. right? And you're like, what's a tool if you hate it? You're not going to sign into Canboard if you hate it. If the UI sucks or if you know, whatever, if you don't like it, then you're not going to use it. There's just no, no doubt about it. I mean, you sign in and you go this in whatever way is not enjoyable. I don't enjoy any part of this. And you just kind of, it. you almost dread it. Right. And I, I don't know if where you're going with it, but it's exact. I'll step back and say that I feel the same way. If, What's a tool if you hate it? And and you went to the exact same spot that that I do by default, which is, well, the UI must suck then, right? Or or, sure. or something else. But right. but imagine where something like Handboard, for instance, is going yeah. to be introduced into an organization to replace time cards, right? And it's billed by upper management as this is our new time card system. You're going to use this, but it's going to be awesome, but it's going to replace our time cards. And then you got, you you know, you got the grumbling employees that are like, I hate time cards. People like, are I, averse to change. Well, not right? even, not even that, not even that, but it's like in their mind, this is the new time card system, right? And they don't hate it because of the bad UI. They don't hate it because of the collaboration. They hate it because they see it as the new time card tool. Right. That takes a lot to sit down and say, all right, well, we sent out a whole bunch of messaging about why this is going to be awesome for you and how easy it is to work with. Why don't you like it? And people's first reaction isn't isn't almost ever going to be the truth. People almost come back with a lie and it could be a lie that they're telling themselves, but they're almost always going to come back and say, I don't know or whatever. Right. And it takes time. And this is. This is the frustrating part about emotional intelligence, right? Is that it takes time to dig down into the problem. It's almost right. never going to be, can you file a bug report for an emotional issue? No, you can't. <laughs> so you're going to have to sit down with someone and say, well, you obviously don't like using this. Like, I don't, I don't know how to make it better for you other than right. to, to figure out why you don't like it. And it could be something as deep seated as, look, I just, I hated time cards. This is a new time card thing. Therefore I hate it. And then, then you can sit down and say, all right, well, let's, let's start with removing the entire aspect of time cards and, and let's, let's address that issue. Right. But that's after a lot of chipping away at, at, you know, what, what do you, what do you actually, how does that make you feel? Right. Um, is it, 
does it remind you of something? You know, all these kind of in it. Right. It almost sounds like going to a therapist. And I hate saying that, but like you really have to start connecting with people and you have to get right. down to their. You've heard enough of this word, but, you know, their, their vision, right? What they see stuff as, their interpretation, their point of view. Having that empathy is super important in order to positively lead people along because in order to lead them along, you know, carrot in the sick, you got to give them something that they want, right? And you got to take away that, that whatever is hindering them. And if it's, if it's not something that's easy to fix, like a UI, you know, if it's if it's something emotional, then you are going to have to sit down and go over it and say, obviously, there's a mental block, you, you know, like w- when you when you ran into the issue, you know, with uh, w- with the the notifications, and I'm you're like, I'm just I'm just burned out, right? And right. I, I'm glad we were able to to talk our way to that point because if it was like a technical issue, then I would have spent like six hours just like getting run deck or working on the API or something like that. Whereas you're like, I am literally just mentally done with this logic. And I'm like, that's fine. I can step in and and help you out. Let me address the burnout before I address the technical issue. Right. Absolutely. More of my notes here. This is more important than ever when adopting new tooling and changing the day-to-day functions of an organization, no matter how small the organization is. If you're changing the tooling that you're using to get to the end goal, you might think, well, is is my vision changed? Did, did we switch? And I completely, did, the vision right. did, did I miss something? And you have to talk through that. And you're like, no, well, no, this, this is a tool for us to get to that vision. Or you, or yes, it did change. Uh, and, and it's going to be better because, and then you start getting into visionary type leadership where you're, you're moving everyone towards, towards that goal. Um, you know, for, for example, you know, when someone considers their task is completed, um, but in your point of view, it's like one fifth of the way completed, then you have a problem, right? Sure. Uh, and, and some recent examples I came around is, uh, one of my, one of my friends has a w- network engineer who was tasked with spinning up a Windows database server. Uh, it was like a, a replica of one that was already in their environment. You know, yeah. can, you, can you spin this up, please? Um, it took him about three times longer than the due date was uh, to do this. And when it was handed over, it was simply a vanilla Windows VM. It wasn't set up at all. It wasn't configured. It wasn't tested. It was nothing. Nothing. And and you got to say, where was the breakdown here? Right. What what was going through that? Did we, you know, going back to the servicing, recognizing and meeting follower, client or customer needs. Right. We didn't recognize the need or, or the need wasn't communicated. Right. I, I need a Windows VM is what was heard. And the Windows VM was delivered. And now some crazy guy's getting mad at me because it doesn't have a database on it. I, I don't know what's going on. Right. And, and that's the point of view of someone who doesn't get that communication. So, so setting those expectations is, is going to be very important. That's, that's a service part of the, the social awareness. Um, you know, and, and Jack, like I said, you and I went up, you know, why do we write documentation? Right. Well, why we write documentation is, is for the needs of clients, customers, or, or, or others, right? And in order to have good documentation that we can, we can go off of and that's, you know, we need to set those expectations. So the expectation is the, the documentation is going to help the podcast. It's going to be show notes for the podcast. It's going right. to be a reference for future clients. Uh, so, so there's all these reasons why we write documentation, right? And, and defining those, we can write better documentation. If, if our visions are completely separate, then what you write is not going to be what I expect. And, and the only way to, to bring those two de- together to kind of meet in the middle is to sit down and say, why are we doing this? You know, is, is what are right. the reasons and, and therefore what should we expect? Uh, so I, I do point out here, uh, that the, the way I like to do that is using the description field of a task, uh, in a, in a Camboard task, uh, following the, the why done and how, uh, I think that covers everything that you need to, to set that kind of expectation. Uh, and, and if it doesn't, then you get to go back and say, all right, well, this is what we had written up. Um, looks like we were inaccurate. Let's have that conversation again and and fix it. 
So that's that's pretty easy. Um, and, it, it, you know, it can also come back to autonomy, mastery, and purpose, but I'm not going to dive into that uh, right now. I did put a – I think we've – brought that up like three times now so there's Today, a yeah. yeah 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 there's a there's a link back to the uh the bit episode episode five where we go over autonomy mastery and purpose uh and and if you want to search any of the show notes you can go up to the search link at the top of the page on arkhamposcast.com and you can search for autonomy and a- every time every time we've we've uh written that down in the show notes uh that episode will pop up so if you want to go back and review i know we've touched on it plenty of times uh, so Quite that a few times, yeah. yeah that that should be able to pop up for you. The next section that I wanted to talk about was relationship management, and 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 it's not something that I want to skim over, but I'm afraid I'm I'm probably not the right person to completely exposit on this, but I did want to put together some of my thoughts on what's going on, and I'll start with with a personal anecdote. So I was I was just chatting on Twitch with uh with one of the streamers that I follow, uh Pineapple Hoops. We were talking about uh, how to deal with people, right? And a whole bunch of people in a Twitch room and 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 a streamer sitting down kind of chilling with us. And odd place to have a discussion, but I I came out of it with with a new perspective. A lot of what I like to do is is clarify rather than rather than lie right i i fundamentally believe that no one comes to work in the morning saying i'm just i'm gonna mess up andrew's day right no one no one comes and is like i'm just gonna be i'm just i just want to butt heads with someone today or if you do i mean that's you don't do it for long so (laughs) what happens when you need to get something across to someone. She, she had a couple things here to say. The first one was that sometimes things need to be said in a diplomatic way and not just bleh, you know? And I'm like, well, yeah, I know that. But like, like I'm good at being diplomatic. I'm, I'm good at, you know, being diplomatic is just making sure there's no misunderstandings, right? Right? And And she had an interesting response to that one. She said, how do you decide or do you decide how this, how what you say is going to make this person feel? And I was like, that is not a thought that crosses my mind. I, I just don't think about that. I, I, I don't. One of my gut reactions is not, how is this going to make them feel? My gut reaction is, how is this going to clarify the misunderstanding that we have? Right. Right. And I said something to that effect. And she said, if I heard that I would be like, ooh, too clear. And, and that makes sense to me. If, if, if you were to be approached with that situation, it's like, oh, this is, this is simply a misunderstanding. I don't care about your feelings. I don't care how you feel about this. I don't know. I don't care about oh, your yeah. emotional okay. investment yeah. in the problem. Yeah. Yeah. I don't care yeah. about the yeah. time and energy that you put into this. We just have a misunderstanding. So let's clear that right. up. Right. Right. That right. is, that is absolutely too clear. Now, it's not an incorrect approach, but it's certainly an uncaring approach, right? It's it's an approach that does not take into account how this is going to make the person feel. That was just eye opening to me because that that's that's a response that she mentioned that she has. Like that's that's a response she she considers. That's something that she considers when she's given a response to someone. She considers how is this going to make the person feel. And and that's not something that I consider. Uh, so so that was that was my takeaway with that. The next thing that jumped off the page at me from again Heather Farron's write up and her evaluation. She said people need to feel heard. They need to not feel this is just another top down thing. To get buy in, people love to interact with ideas before it's set in stone. This will make them feel heard and valued. It will also allow us to gain valuable insights into potential misunderstandings before an official rollout by making them feel heard. Finally, by drawing them into the process before completion, they will feel an ownership of it because they touched it before it was finalized. And this remains true even if the tool is 99.9% complete. Right. Without buy-in, you're trying to lead people where they don't want to go. 
Taking time to get buy-in is like taking time to show people a travel brochure and letting people get excited about the journey. If the goal is buy-in, the extra time it takes is worth the years of positive momentum. When it comes to change, efficient is not always effective. And what have I said time and time again? We need to be effective, not efficient. Right. 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 To come back, Jack, to your, your initial gut reaction about if someone doesn't like Camboard, it's like, well, the UI must suck then. It's like, well, no, the, the person feels a way about something. And, right. And that matters. Right. And and yeah, a lot of this is about rollout um, of, of new tooling and new processes. And that's that's probably going to be the crux of the matter, because as, as soon as you start changing stuff, people get concerned. People don't like change. Change is hard. And. Yeah. And approaching it as in, oh, you miss on you must misunderstand where the vision is. Let me show you the vision. Right. Where, where I'm over here and you're over here, right? You have to sit down and you have to say, all right, what's your vision? You know, how are you seeing this? How is this coming together in your head? You have to merge the visions, right? Yeah. Right. If, right. If, if you can't find common ground, you haven't gone deep enough. And, and that is one of my core beliefs. I, I, I do fundamentally believe that no one comes to work or no one comes into a conversation saying, I'm just going to make this person as upset as humanly possible. And that is all that I'm trying to get out of this conversation. There's always going to be some kind of people want to feel important. Uh, you know, there, there could be some kind of collaboration they're looking for, or there's a lot that's going on beneath the surface of, of human beings. And we have to realize that everything we do is dealing with human beings. Even right. if we approach it on a philosophically correct technical level right you have to sit down and say these are actual people we need to be we need to be caring right and we need to be fair right one current example of a way this had not been done is richard m stallman's outspokenness about the technical accuracy of the term sexual assault the way he handled the situation was not with empathy he was outspoken about a term being used incorrectly in a very sensitive situation, right? The, the situation was human trafficking, right? And the term was sexual assault. And he took issue with the term sexual assault being used in what, what his, I think it was his colleague, um, what he was guilty of was not sexual assault. It was certainly misconduct. It was it was not right of him to do this. It was, you know, he should have whatever. But Richard Solman took issue with his colleague being charged with sexual assault and assault in the in the purest form of the, the term. Right. Unfortunately, that nuance didn't right. make its way across the Internet as nuance usually doesn't make its way across the Internet very well. And. There was enough push for and, and local outrage for him to be effectively canceled. There was a vocal outcry against him because people still believe and, and he's held controversial opinions. So they have no shortage of a backlog of things to go back and nitpick on. And, sure. and that's fine. Sure. Uh, and, and no, of course, of course not. I don't agree with all of his positions, but I think in the subsequent open letter in support of him that was published. There was a very good point made. It says, uh, I think it's like the second or third part paragraph. I do link to it in the show notes here. It says, historically, RMS has been expressing his views in ways that upset many people. He is usually more focused on the philosophical underpinnings and pursuing the objective truth and linguistic purism while underemphasizing people's feelings on matters he's commenting on. This makes his arguments vulnerable to misunderstanding and misrepresentation, something which we feel is happening in the open letter calling for his removal. His words need to be interpreted in this context and taking into account that more often than not, he's not looking to put things diplomatically. 
right? So what he's trying to do, and 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 this is what I would take out of that, uh, he's usually more focused on the philosophical underpinnings and pursuing the objective truth and linguistic purism, while underemphasizing people's feelings on matters he's commenting on, which results in him not looking to put things diplomatically, right? And sure, if you're dealing with a meritocracy, if you're dealing with free BSD kernel code that introduces vulnerabilities for millions of people, yes, you need to be linguistically pure about the code. You need to be fundamentally have a have a philosophical underpinnings on how that code works, how it should be set up, what areas it should be touching, how it returns variables, you know, s- stuff like that right. counts. You stuff like that right. matters, right. Right. right? You have to be accurate. However, when dealing with people, when you are trying to dissect what you perceive to be a slight against someone else, you can't go in with guns blazing and saying, this is not linguistically pure enough for me. You have to go in with a, a caring attitude and you have, you have to decide, how is this going to make this person feel, right? Is really dissecting the nature of the term sexual assault a good ROI for me at this point? Is this going to win me any favors or is this me being pedantic? That was, that was one of the things is, as I was reading this book that I, you know, it was, it's very hard for me to read, right? Because that's, that's not something I do. And it's something that I'm suffering the consequences of right now. So I'm, I'm, I'm reading this. I'm like, you, you have to care about how, how people interpret what you say. And I'm like, well, I don't want to have to go through that level of effort. But then again, everything's going to be effort. Everything's going to have this emotional kind of weight to it. You you gotta you gotta go through the human factor before you can get to the the cool techie stuff. And people who don't understand that right. end up in a black box somewhere in in the corner with with right. no window, right? If if you still have a job, if you don't tick off the wrong people, so. And it's something I'm going to be working on. This is going to be integral for 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 people like me, right? For for techies to 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 go through to to know to be able to to deal with the human factor. And if you're listening to this, there's a chance that you know someone else who needs to have this conversation, who needs to go through this process of of learning and and, and self evaluation and 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 figuring out how am I supposed to be working with people, right? In order to share the show, go ahead and, and, and share the link to the episode with them, right? So we can bring them into these discussions that we have. So we can get that kind of feedback. So we can nurture this kind of community um, and 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 have these discussions on on how to lead and, and how to work in a team and productivity, open source software, and all that kind of goodness. Um, and with that, we hope you enjoyed this episode of our Composecast. Thank you. Be safe. And we'll see you all in two weeks. Bye, everybody.